welcome to our chat about making apps accessible. I'm so grateful to be able to join you all for the El for Elementary's EDW EDW conference. But before we get started, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Anna. I use the pronouns she or they. I'm a senior accessibility designer at Northwestern Mutual, and I'm a master's student at the Atlas Institute of CU Boulder. In academia and industry alike, I've chosen to specialize in designing digital experiences that are as inclusive as possible, specializing in accessibility. In my free time, I'm an artist, gamer, and writer. I have two adorable cats named Felix and Onyx, uh, shown here, a uh, gray tabby and a black cat, black short hair. You may see one or both of those cats running around in my background today, but I will do my best to prevent that. Now, over the past nine years of my career, learning about inclusive design has been fettered with blockers and educational gaps. So it's my ambition to help unblock designers, developers, and tech folks who want to build better, more inclusive experiences. Today, we're going to talk about what accessibility means for tech professionals, and a lot of this will include some of the basics, but we will talk about some of the essential considerations also for uh, app development, particularly, as well as uh, focusing on the operating system and, and things that go within that. Still, we'll focus on these essential elements because they tie directly in to our accessibility understanding, regardless of what platform we're designing and developing for. And we'll talk about what that means and how that applies in this context and as we go through. Okay, so every time I give one of these talks, I have to start it with why we should be talking about accessibility and why it matters. And a lot of us just haven't been taught about this and why this is so important. So I think it's one of the most essential parts of just starting one of these conversations, even if you're already aware uh, as to why this matters and who we want to serve when we're doing this. This way, we're all on the same page as we go through the specific considerations. Accessibility advocacy is part of my job, along with making my designs and enabling others to make their designs more accessible. Even organizations like yours or ones that you're, you know, that you're a part of currently, if they're bought in already, they still require a certain degree of understanding and advocacy no matter what. So having the skills to not only just know why this matters, to, but to be able to communicate why it matters with your teams is an essential skill of understanding how to make your work accessible. Knowing why it matters is the start for every conversation. Now, if we look at successful businesses like Apple, IBM, and Microsoft, we can, all, we can see they all have years of ongoing dedication to accessibility. And that's no coincidence because a lot of them are succeeding and they're doing well. And any of us can talk about why we love elementary or our iOS or our, you know, our PCs, um, but you know, sometimes we can forget about the reasons we like them and the reasons we like them being ease of use and accessibility. Uh, some of these are things like iOS's Siri, for example, which was originally born out of accessibility considerations. Accessibility has been shown to help products and experiences create amazing products and experiences. Rather, to say they help us innovate past our bare minimum expectations. They help us go beyond what we expect to work and exceed far beyond uh, where we've been before. And doing this means that our products can win against our competitors by capturing often overlooked markets uh, and reducing our legal risk while we do so. But most importantly, doing accessibility and including it in our work means that we are improving the lives of disabled people. Now, for an example of how inclusive design innovates, I like to pull up one that's quite recent. We can look at Nike's Go Fly E sneakers, which are different than digital product design, but still include these principles and include them well. And it's a really good example of this. A few years ago, 16-year-old Matthew Walzer wrote a letter to Nike's design director asking for a shoe that could, he could put on independently with his cerebral palsy. Walzer wrote, 
My dream is to go to the college of my choice without having to worry about someone coming to tie my shoes every day. Once Nike received this letter, they began developing a sneaker in partnership with Walzer and delivered their first release of that product a few months ago. These shoes have also become popular for people with a range of disabilities and needs because their design enables ease of use for all. And again, the same practice can be applied in digital products, applications, and operating systems. In most situations, there's no need to differentiate between usability and accessibility because their goals are actually quite complementary. Inclusive design is just better design, and accessibility is a form of inclusive design that focuses on disabled users. But another thing about designing with disabled people in mind is that 15 to 20 percent of people across the globe are disabled. Accessibility isn't a special need. It's just a need. It's not an edge case. It's core functionality. Every day, as tech professionals, we make choices that impacts people all over the world. We see the impacts of those choices in the software, websites, apps, operating systems, and all of the things that we're creating. But we can also see those systemic impacts of inaccessibility everywhere. And we are designers, developers, tech professionals, because we want to make the world a better place. We want our work to have a positive impact. We want to make a difference in people's lives. We have disabled users now, and we're always going to have them as long as there are people. So by including accessibility into our process, we can meet our personal goals while also helping to expand the understanding of usability to broader and more marginalized audiences, which is really, really important. Accessible design is just also better for everyone because many of us are disabled or will become disabled in our lives. Accessibility isn't just for an ambiguous and unknown user. It's for our friends, our families, and ourselves. The persona spectrum shown here, sourced from Microsoft's Inclusive Design Toolkit, shows how accessibility can help people with permanent disabilities, such as blindness, temporary disabilities, such as cataracts, and even situational disabilities like distracted driving. The same logic can be applied to users who are using your applications, your systems, and your products. They can be experiencing a range of situations that affect how they interact with it at any given time. Not only this, but accessibility is a fundamental human right. People use our products to get healthcare, pay bills, get jobs, and yes, have fun. It's not a matter of accommodation when the designs we put out in the world might be the only way people have access. We create disability when we design without accessibility in mind. People feel that exclusion and they become disempowered. So our goal is to empower people, especially people who have been systemically marginalized. So these are some of the reasons for accessibility, but what does accessible design look like in practice? What does accessible development look like in practice? To make our work accessible, the first thing we need to understand is who we're considering when we create this. And the reason we talk about that is because people who are disabled are often using adaptive techniques and technology to interact with what we have created and put out there. So understanding how they're interacting and, and the ways that they're using this adaptive tech can help inform how we can better build out our products to serve and, you know, and, and be there for them. Uh, the benefit of that, of course, is as we discussed, impact, the impact of accessibility is that it helps everybody and that it's good for our businesses. Now, the first group of people we'll focus on are people with vision disabilities. Now, when it comes to vision disabilities, keep in mind that people have a range of blindness and color loss, or excuse me, vision loss, uh, that doesn't just go from zero to 100. That is to say, people can be using things like screen readers sometimes and not other times, or that they have um, color blindness, but it affects them in one part of the color, or a few colors, but not others. Those, uh, this is essentially the way we want to think about 
disabilities in general. It's not on or off. People experience a range of needs uh, and have a set of different circumstances that affect them uniquely. So when we think about vision loss, we think about people with blindness, degenerative vision loss, color blindness, and low vision. Now, for us, a big part of this is thinking about people who use screen reader technology. And I think one of the best ways for us to understand that is to actually experience a native screen reader user interacting, in this case, with a website uh, and seeing and hearing how that, that interaction occurs and the possible blockers that exist for them. So I'm going to go ahead and play a video for us for just a moment. This is Mark Sutton from the University of California, San Francisco's IT Web Services Department. Here today with a brief tour of screen reading technology. I'm a blind person who has been using screen readers, braille writers, scanning equipment, other adaptive technologies since my childhood. What a screen reader does is, for example, I'm going to read this, start to read this page. Navigation one. Link. University of California, San Francisco. Link. About UCSF. Link. Search UCSF. And what I will now do is slow down the speech rate. Rating percent. 75%, 70%, 65%, 60%, 55%, 55%, 45%, link, UCSF Medical Center. So as I was about to say, a screen reader converts what's on a computer screen into information that can be displayed through synthetic speech or braille output. And it does that by allowing you to use a computer instead of a mouse, a computer keyboard instead of a mouse. You can also use a braille display as an input device. End of navigation. And what it does is it cleverly determines what's on the screen and presents you that information you in a way that would allow for efficient navigation of these pages. So for example, I could just keep reading. Banner three items. Visited link image home. Line by line and we could be here all day. Or I could jump to the first heading on the page. Heading level two. Search for heading level two. You are here. Heading level one. Make videos accessible. So as I'm moving down through the page, I can look for the category that interests me. And I'm just using you commands built into the screen reader. So that's all a pretty simple description of what a screen reader is all about. Now I'm going to go over and show a few examples. Now, for our purposes, since we've got, you know, we've got a little bit of time today, uh, we won't watch the whole video. However, I highly encourage, and we'll make sure that you know you will have access to this presentation. Uh, I highly encourage watching the whole thing. Um, it's super interesting to watch how folks are interacting with websites and with products using screen reader technology, and I enjoy it every time. Additionally, we want to be mindful of people who have limited vision. These are just a few example of examples of the ways that people might have limited vision and how that might limit them on a page that doesn't allow them to adjust according to their needs. For example, being able to zoom a screen up to 2000, or excuse me, 200% without loss of content or functionality. And then of course, let's not forget folks who have color blindness. That makes up 4.5% of the population. There are four examples here shown where we have full color perception, red green color blindness, blue yellow color blindness, and then no color perception, which is rare. We want to be mindful that we're not just applying color as a way of conveying information to our users. That is to say, for example, maybe not using just a green dot to indicate a status, but also having text next to it that says what the status is, online, green, offline, gray, things like that. A combination of elements to ensure that someone can understand what is being conveyed to them fully. Another key group, group of people to keep in mind are people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Again, deafness can have a range between partial deafness or complete deafness. Either way, remember, don't rely on audio to indicate the meaning of something in any context. Now, with our design and development of apps and products, this tends to not come up too much, but it can come up, particularly when you're focusing on a product that's video focused, say YouTube, for example. So be mindful of things like this when it comes to videos, podcasts, webinars, music, and more. Now, 
in this case, we're also going to talk about things like sign language and sign language interpretation. I'm going to show a quick video of a British sign language interpretation and captions so that you can see how videos can be made more accessible to people who are deaf and hard of hearing. This is bad. Something's not right. This could be an emergency. Stop panicking. Okay, it's probably nothing. We don't want to waste anybody's time. Hang on, according to this forum, it could be indigestion. Or an exploding appendix. Don't listen to this guy. I really don't know what to do, okay? Go, 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 go. <laughs> Just chill out, man. When you're not sure what to do, go straight to NHS 111 online. And if needed, a healthcare professional will call you. Help us help you know what to do. Again, that's an example of British Sign Language versus what we have in America, American Sign Language. There are facets of understanding and communication within accessibility, and that is super cool too, and I definitely recommend learning more. But again, captions are a great way to start making content like this more accessible to all of your users. In fact, many users who use captions aren't deaf or hard of hearing. Oops, there we go. There we go. We also need to be mindful of people with motor disabilities, such as paralysis, muscular dystrophy, and joint conditions, and more. Now, you might be wondering, how does someone with a motor disability need to be served in a digital context? And there's a lot of answers to this question, depending on the platform and the need. But in general, this comes down to keyboard accessibility or swipe, inter uh, what, excuse me, swipe accessibility and voice interfaces. Others with some with severe paralysis may put a stylus in their mouth and use that to navigate a keyboard and a touchscreen. So you'll also want to avoid requiring someone to perform an action in a specific way to do what they need to do. So for example, avoiding forced swipe functionality on a touch interface, instead offering alternative means of access is going to be key. So another example, let's walk through how someone who has uh, a, who has a form of paralysis, or rather uses uh, a mouth stick to navigate, uh, does that. This is how I use my phone. A woman in a power wheelchair uses a mouth stick to operate a smartphone that's sitting on the table. Able Thrive. Hashtag, this is how I. Share that one's a little bit shorter, but you can kind of get the idea of, of, you know, how people interact with something like a phone very differently than you might expect. And so this is something that people are doing more commonly than you might think. So it's important to be mindful of that. Additionally, we want to be mindful of people with speaking disabilities. This includes things like muteness, stuttering, um, and a few other uh, disabilities that affect speaking. Uh, and in this case, a lot of our interactions focus on voice interfaces and ensuring that our voice detection tools can work with people who have speaking disabilities. Now, I'm going to talk about this one pretty briefly just because I, um, I think it's a super interesting subject, but definitely relates a lot to voice UI and a lot to conversational UI. And that could be a whole nother talk. So know to be mindful of this and that, again, captions can be very helpful here. I'm going to skip through this video, but know it's made available to you. This is Google's project Euphonia, which focuses on uh, rendering speech to text with uh, speaking disabilities. And then last but certainly not least, keep in mind people with cognitive disabilities. People with cognitive disabilities tend to be the least understood in the context of product design and development. This includes people with autism, attention deficit, dyslexia, seizure disorders, and more. I know that there are a lot of things to keep in mind when it comes to serving people with cognitive disabilities. In this case, I generally mentioned that improved usability as a whole is super valuable. Often things that we call better UX directly correlate to improved accessibility for people with cognitive disabilities. Better copy, hierarchy, structure, consistency, all of these are going to play a big part in serving your users with cognitive disabilities.
Now, last but not least, you might be thinking, well, that's a lot of people that I need to think of. And how can I possibly design and develop with, you know, with all of these needs in mind? Well, I've got good news for you. We have a lot of great accessibility standards that have been thoroughly vetted and continually developed to reference when working to meet accessibility standards. Many of these are interchangeable. Some of the, the things that you will do will serve different parts of populations. Again, like our captions serving our deaf and hard of hearing users, our users who have speaking disabilities. And by the way, those could also serve people with cognitive disabilities. So be mindful that there are not, it's not as bad as, or excuse me, it's not bad. It's, it, there's plenty out there that can support you and that there's um, plenty of opportunities to do well while meeting the group's needs of different groups all at once. And when it comes to following accessibility practices online, the best place to start is with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. WCAG is a set of specific standards designed to make the web more accessible to people with disabilities. This guide can evaluate, you know, marketing websites, our favorite blogs, a web app, and really anything that can be accessed online. But what's really cool about this is that the worldwide worldwide web consortium, try saying that five times fast, broke these in these guidelines and how they're applied into operating systems and applications themselves and provided documentation into additional considerations. So long story short, you can use the web content accessibility guidelines in the context of designing apps, developing apps, whether they're web-based or specific to an operating system or based on the operating system itself, the practices and principles are generally the same, even if some of the implementation details are different. Now, WCAG or WCAG is broken into four guiding principles, stating that web content must be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, spelling the acronym POOR. Perceivable means removing any barriers to accessing our content by providing alternative methods of access. Operable means that our content, along with anything interactive on it, can be controlled through various tools like screen readers, for example. Understandable means to use language and functionality that's easy to comprehend and consistent. And lastly, robust means that our content should work well across different platforms. Now, you don't need to memorize these. More than anything, understand at a high level that these are the things to keep in mind and that this applies to how WCAG is formatted. WCAG essentially has a set of guidelines that holds, excuse me, all of those four principles. So every guideline included in WCAG fits into one of these four categories. Now that's super important because you can kind of get the idea of what's being included in there and how it applies when you're thinking about it in that context. Now, Additionally, every item in WCAG is going to have a rating system. Now, these four principles act as the categories that help hold all those specific guidelines, but the rating system helps us understand how essential it is for us to consider in our products. To help understand what the guidelines are, the most essential, excuse me, <laughs> to help us understand what these guidelines are, I've broken them out with a sort of basic understanding. The, essentially, the A rating is the bare minimum, the AA rating is good, uh, and the AAA rating is amazing. As a team, you generally want to pick what level you seek to meet and then use that as a goal for how accessible your work should be. Now, for reference, most organizations choose AA as their bare minimum compliance level. And as a call out, there's no experience entirely AAA compliant in every page or category. Most experiences have a range of accessibility compliance levels and different pieces factor into our design accessibility, such as what's on a page or what components being used. So be mindful that these are, these are our goals. These are things we want to think about in terms of what do we want to meet, how do we want to meet it, and you know, what do we strive for in the long run. They're not like 
a grade per se, but we do want to try to seek to meet at least bare minimum, and that is at least A levels. Now, to provide some context, I've broken out compliance levels using color contrast on a button as an example. We have four different buttons in different shades of gray on a light background and then on a dark background. The ratings on these show if the contrast is high enough to be legible. As you can see, or rather not see, the first button on the left does not meet acceptance levels on a dark background. But that same button has a AAA rating on a light background, and we can see similar instances depending on how color is applied. WCAG color contrast compliance indicated in guidelines 1.4.3 and 1.4.6 only have A, AA, excuse me, and AAA levels. Now, ideally, we would want to meet AAA, sure, but AA works just as well, as shown here. We can also increase our compliance level by increasing our font size or our font weight. That is to say, making it bold versus regular size weight. So how we apply WCAG and what our guidelines, the, what the guidelines that we are considering are really depends on our goals, our teams, and the ways that we're building things themselves. But it's really important to be mindful of that as something like a button when used everywhere can change how an entire experience is being interpreted and interacted with. If you have a single button that doesn't meet color contrast compliance and it's being used across your application, then you end up with the possibility that users are struggling to interact with a button across the application. And it's kind of the same way as design itself when you think about it. You want to make sure the core elements and the components themselves that you're using when designing and developing an app or an experience are as accessible as possible. And that empowers your team to be more likely to scale up, to be more accessible as you scale up. It's not always gonna be like this. There's, there's always going to be times where the component itself needs to be considered a little bit further when it comes to the implementation details. But when you're starting with an accessible system to start with, and you're, you end up with the ability to be more likely to support this. And that's why I usually recommend starting accessibility in design systems. As you're digging into your accessible design practice, I've put together some resources and tools to help you get started. Now, WCAG's, excuse me, WCAG's Quick Reference Guide is a fantastic resource, but I've also included the A11Y Project Checker if you prefer. Now, the A11Y project as a whole is also a great resource. I recommend these resources to those who are not as familiar with WCAG and accessibility practices as a whole, and who want sort of a, a checklist to get started as a way to kind of validate if they're passing or doing something or need to be thinking about something as they're going through their work. Keep in mind that not everything's going to need to be checked against everything. That is to say, you don't need to be necessarily thinking about caption accessibility in the context of creating a button. So know that while these lists can feel a little intimidating at first, when you're using them on specific pages in specific contexts, they tend not to be as intimidating as you might think. Additionally, I've also included some specific documentation that talks about accessibility for non-web technology, that is to say, operating systems, APIs, uh, ICT products, again, non-web products that focus on how to meet accessibility standards and how WCAG applies in those specific contexts. Again, you're going to want to use those principles as a whole, and the great news is that we live in a time where a lot of those principles are finally being conglomerated into WCAG, but you can use these additional three guides shown here as a way to kind of establish a little bit further, go farther than what's being indicated, and have more specific guidelines because there are going to be things that do different, differ, especially when it comes to things like how it's being developed and the implementation details around that. Keep in mind that we're all gonna be learning and growing. The biggest thing I wanna emphasize, and I know there's so much to take away from these conversations, is that you don't have to be perfect. 
I know our time's brief. And I know if this is something new to you that you might feel a little overwhelmed. But all I have to say is that everything you do, every effort you make to be more accessible makes an impact. Every time you dig into an accessibility question or a thought, you're empowering yourself to learn more. And when you're discussing that with your team, you're empowering them to do the same. Every time we have conversations about this and, and facilitate those conversations, that helps everybody grow and all of our products thrive and succeed when it comes to inclusivity. Those conversations can make us less afraid and push for accessibility in a way that doesn't make people or each other feel defensive. And that's really important for the work we're doing. You don't have to be an accessibility expert to advocate for accessibility. So know that you don't have to be perfect and know that there are many ways to be an advocate. With that, I wanna thank you, especially thank everyone at Elementary and EDW for talking coming and inviting me to this talk, or to give this talk, I should say, and, uh, you know, for taking the time to learn more about this at a, you know, at any level, because it's so important. That was great. And now for a live Q&A, Dan and Anna are joining us. And I loved that talk. Anna, thank you so much for being here today. Take it away. Hey, Anna, thank you so much for that talk. That was so good. Um, you know, we got so many great questions in chat, actually. And it's it's cool because a couple people are talking about um, this idea that they don't really consider themselves disabled, but they really benefit from accessibility features. Can you talk a little bit about your perspective on that? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of us, uh, especially in the accessibility community, talk about how uh, accessible features tend to be better for all users. And I remember reading even quite recently that 80% of people using things like captions aren't deaf or hard of hearing. So things like, you know, things that we may not consider uh, as minimum viable product are actually tend to be things that, you know, people find beneficial overall. And so, you know, they call it the corner, uh, corner cut effect where, you know, in the example, in the example of the corner cut effect, you talk about, you know, a sidewalk that has the cut so that people in wheelchairs can get up and down the sidewalk, you know, with ease. Well, this also benefits people who have strollers, people on bicycles, people who have canes, people who, you know, like me are uncoordinated in general. Um, so there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of like great things that come with, um, that come with accessible design. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, so um, you know, one of the, the questions I'd like to ask you here is, what are what are some of the most common issues or accessibility traps that you've noticed in your day to day usage of some apps and platforms? It's a it's a great question. Um, I think the most common traps I see are. Um, are not really thinking of like thinking only visually and not programmatically. So where you tend to see some of the biggest gaps for users is uh, how how you're let's saying applying a heading to some t uh, some of your um, content and having it only visually structured instead of thinking about it in terms of what's being represented in your code. And so, you know, I think that comes up a lot for things like, you know, even just adding alt text or making sure your structure is consistent or um, heck, making sure that uh, that everything's kind of semantically tied to your design, which is why, you know, accessibility is a designer's job, too. Yeah. Um, you know, Ando says uh, that he notices that there's a lot of emphasis now finally being put on accessibility in tech. But uh, he's wondering uh, what role does inclusivity have in uh, accessibility? I mean, it's a very important question because um, in tech, we tend to think about, you know, even when we can, we're getting people to start thinking about accessibility. We aren't connecting the dots with inclusivity and accessibility as a whole. And while accessibility is important, it's a, it's a part of inclusivity, not the whole. So, you know, I think 
a big part of this is remembering that um, a lot of accessible design also benefits users who have low bandwidth. It also benefits users who, um, you know, generally speaking, have been marginalized in other ways. Um, now, that being said, there are also additional considerations that we need to be mindful of when it comes to making sure our users who are uh, Black, Indigenous people of color are being served and seen and represented and that, you know, our LGBTQIA folks are being represented and, um, and everyone has a place they feel welcome and included and it's super important and it's not emphasized enough in tech yet it, it's happening but it's not being talked about enough so it's a great question and what i will say is the answer is not easy yeah, I love that. And you're right that, you know, we are we are seeing starting to make a little bit more inroads into talking about accessibility, but we need to really platform um, people that are that are working on inclusivity as a whole. Um, we have another question from chat here. Um, what do you think about uh, AI assistants like Siri or Cortana and their role in accessibility and if we should be investing in that kind of thing in the Linux desktop space? Honestly, I think uh, tools like Siri came out of accessible design and uh, disabled users use those that functionality all of the time. And so it, in terms of you know, investing in that. I think voice interfaces are already becoming huge as, you know, as we're speaking right now. And so, you know, if I would, if I could say like broadly speaking, investing in it um, is, is, is gonna be important, but it's also important for your marginalized, your disabled users. And so if you have the capacity to consider voice UI and uh, those interactions, I would absolutely advocate for it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's something that I know that I use all the time on my phone is, is the voice assistant. And it's just, it's really helpful when you just don't have a free hand as well, or when you're multitasking or, you know, working with someone else or driving and, and just um, maybe, you know, experiencing a temporary disability too, right? Like pains. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, maybe temporary disability in that context? Yeah, this is such a great point. You know, um, if you haven't seen what well, you've seen it, but if, if other folks haven't had a chance to look at it, Microsoft has an inclusive design toolkit and it is super helpful. But it also talks about how disability is not necessarily permanent. That is to say, some of us are disabled momentarily or temporarily or situationally. And so, for example, I could have a broken arm and that would limit my ability to interact with certain things. Or, you know, a bright light could be shining on my phone screen. It would make it hard for me to read the text that's on that screen. So, you know, it, it's a great question. The reality is that people who aren't medically disabled can still become, you know, socially or, you know, interactively disabled because of uh, of that lack of consideration. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I got one more uh, question from chat before we have to let you go. Um, someone wants to know about uh, video game accessibility, especially with regard to 3D video games. Do you have any experience with that? I mean, what I can say is that I'm just so thrilled with what's happening in the video game community right now. And they've shown us that like, a lot like games like gosh uh the last of us miles morales spider-man story like they have shown us that accessibility can start being integrated today we don't have to wait for for some unknowable legal thing or somebody's permission that starting to make accessible work now makes better work and gosh i am just like with the last year we've all had video game accessibility was even I mean, it was already important, but it was it's so close to my heart because it kept me, you know, kept me together this past year. So my, my experience is there's there's a lot happening and please be paying attention if you like uh, if you like video games. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you hang around uh, in chat to answer a couple more questions. And I'm, I'm really grateful that we had the opportunity to, to platform some uh, accessibility talks here. Thank you. Anna and Dan, thank you very much. I completely agree with the chat room. Makes me think about this in a whole new way.